again from a, a book that she was reading um, where a, an older woman was giving some advice to a younger one. And she said, number one, no matter where life takes you, the place you stand at any moment is holy ground. And two, love hard, love wide, and love long, and you will find goodness in it. And then last week we had Bring a Friend Day, which was a lot of fun. We had some food, we had some, we had some good stuff. And we talked a bit, though, about shutting out the voice that makes us feel powerless. And we talked about being willing to take steps towards the life that we want to experience to the, the pray and move part of this philosophy that we live and breathe and teach. And, and, and mostly, though, I was put to the task of describing for um, people who were here to visit and and you um, who we are as a community. And, and I had listened to um, someone talk about the practice of love, of being loving, somewhat akin to the, uh, to the practice of yoga. And I thought, and that's kind of how I described us. I said, actually, I think NTNC is like a big yoga class. Spiritual practice in stretch and motion and community, which means sometimes stretching is really easy and graceful. And sometimes we fall over and bump up against each other and we help each other rub our edges off. Sometimes someone cries and sometimes we laugh and sometimes someone farts. Sometimes things go exactly how we want them to go. And sometimes they don't. But when we let ourselves, when we don't run away with our yoga pants in a wad, <laughs> usually we learn something either way. Now, the same woman who talked about love being something that needs to be practiced, like yoga, her name was Tracy McMillan, and, um, and she wrote a book called Why You Aren't Married Yet, which... Um, I listened to her on a Super Soul podcast, and, and she has good stuff even if you are married yet, or you're about to be married yet, or, um, or if you are in a long-term relationship that maybe wants some rejuvenation. She had some good stuff. She talked quite a bit about love being way more about what you give than wh about what you get. You know, people spend a lot of time making lists of the things that they want from people and very rarely make lists of what they're going to give in, in return for that. And the best relationships actually come from a place of giving, uh, of turning towards and of not keeping account. You know the count? I've been in that relationship, the count. Well, I did these three things and you've only done one. You know, that count. No one ever comes out ahead in that. The thing I've noticed, or the thing that really came to me about all these things that stretch us in areas of love and compassion, that, that stretch us spirit, spiritually into an expandedness, they apply in our primary relationships and they apply in our spiritual community. Um, what I've noticed about spiritual community is that those who engage, those who... Um, who take a class and open up to other people, those who, those who volunteer, those who give financially in consistent and expansive ways, those people are the most excited and happy to be here. None of those people comes here going, oh, I gotta go to church. It's my turn to make coffee. What are they gonna want me to do next? That's not what happens. What happens is I get to come and make coffee and engage with these people who love me and who care for me. And I've learned that they love and care for me when they come and they don't just come to get coffee from me. They come and say, hello, how are you today? And they really see me. And that's the experience of the people who engage. Now, you know, and I think it's, it's true of everything. There's an inhale, there's an exhale. Like all of life, life is a participatory sport. There is a give and a receive and a receive and a give. And those who give themselves to that natural flow are the most likely to show up and get what they came here for. What I notice also is that, you know, a lot of people come to the door and say, that was exactly what I needed to hear. And, and then they repeat something that I didn't even know I said. But 
it, or you read my diary this week, and what I've noticed is that the preponderance of those people who feel filled up are also the people who are giving back in some way. There is a participatory flow in life. Someone, um, classes, classes are an amazing thing. You get to know people, you, you get to expand. Our curriculum is, is designed for growth. You know, um, we are not really a, a sit and, and not change community so much. We are a stretch and expand and grow community. And, and um, someone, some, a couple of people, someone recently said something about the price of classes. And, and I was like, you know, these classes are priceless. These classes are life-changing and priceless. And don't tell Reverend Sharon, but we actually charge less for them than everyone else does. And if you're a consistent giver here, you really less. And um, the other thing here, and, and if you don't, know, if you if you are wanting to take a class, here's I'm going to the sidebar for a second. If you're wanting to take a class and you feel like they're too expensive, there are scholarship forms right next to the sign-up sheets always, and we have never turned anyone down for one of those. The interesting thing, however, is that um, I've approved several of those over the last year, and no one who received a scholarship is yet to complete a class, which I find fascinating. Not in a judgmental sort of way, it's like, oh, okay, this is interesting, because I, it seems like all those people who, when I was in, back when I was in ministerial school, said people need to participate in financially in class or they don't value it. And I was like, oh, that's not true. Maybe it is, but I think that it's that participation thing, you know? Um, so, it's, so it's interesting and we're still gonna offer scholarships. But life is a participation sport. Life is not sitting on the bench. It can be, it's your choice, but if your life is about sitting on the bench, that's great. Don't be unhappy about that. But life is an action word. Love is an action word. Loving life is an amplified action to the 47th power word, if you munch, munch them together. But loving life does not happen to us. A love of life, life being participatory, it doesn't happen to us. It happens through us and with us and with our consent and with our joining in and with our motion towards it. And it seems like we've forgotten some of this stuff along the way about uh, you know, love being about what we give and not always what we receive. We, we have become so worried about being codependent, like codependent became a thing a while ago. And I think we went from, yes, there's codependency, but then we went like all the way over here to, to I'm going to guard against that and I'm gonna keep track, and I'm gonna be so worried and so afraid of being taken advantage of that I'm going to shut myself off from the flow of give and receive. And you know, a whole bunch of us have this story about how busy we are, and I did, oh my gosh, I caught myself the other day, I did it, again. I don't know if you ever do this, somebody asked me, how are you, Barb? And I said, oh, I've been really busy. Like busy is an emotional state of being, <laughs> right? It's not. It's not. Busy is good. Busy can be good, but then I'm good. I'm not busy. If we're going to really be more loving and more kind and more compassionate, which is the thing that we keep calling for here, or okay, maybe it's my fault. I keep calling for that because then we get opportunities to be more loving and more kind. And I'm going to remind you again that mostly those don't look like kittens. You know, we really, when we're digging into it, we get the most annoying things to practice on. We do. The universe loves to support its greatest expression. And if its greatest expression is one of us being as kind and as loving as we can possibly be, then we're going to get a chance to practice. And that's glorious and annoying, but glorious. <laughs> We have to let go in that of how am I going to get out of this and we get to embrace a better question. How can I serve? How can I show up in a more giving way? How can I show up in a more loving 
way. And trust me, if in, at home, if your relationship is feeling like this, and you show up for a week saying, how can I show up in a more loving way, you will move towards each other naturally. You just will. And then here's the other thing that I've learned, is that when you're thinking things like this, and you're like thinking about the things that you're going to talk about on Sunday, for instance, all of you, if you're thinking about what, what I might say on Sunday, you're going to think about what you're going to come up here and say someday. Um, and you're thinking about how do I be more loving and how do I serve, then the most amazing things show up uh, along the way that help you uh, keep perspective on things. You know, I, I get caught up a lot in, in um, being busy, in, in how do we grow, and how do we, people ask me, a couple people just recently asked me, how come we're not full all the time? I'm like, because we live in Colorado and people go to the mountains and that's my chance to be more loving. <laughs> but I get caught up in those things and when we get caught up in those things thing, and, and we're still in the space of, of how do we serve and how do we be more loving the most amazing things will show up and for me that sometimes shows up in, in stories that I hear from other people I listen to the moth sometimes when I'm in the car which is really hazardous because mostly that means I'm just sobbing in the car <laughs> people must drive by and be like don't roll your window down. But this woman came on the other day. I think she's from Australia. She came on to start to tell a story about her daughter. And I can't remember this woman's name, but I'm going to just call her Grace because that's what comes to mind when I think about the story. Grace tells everyone that a couple of years before, she, um, it came time to have the talk with her eight-year-old daughter. And this was not that talk. It was the talk where they told her that her doctor said that there was no more options for curing her cancer and that she had some decisions to make for herself. And they, her and her husband had decided that even though she was only eight, this was the end of her life, so she should get to decide. And so they told her, and they'd always been honest with her, they told her there was no more treatment. There was a treatment, some more treatment, that it could extend her life by a few months, or there was a shorter life and letting that go. And the girl, April, she said that her daughter thought about it for a couple of days and would ask questions and talk about it, and, and that she came to the conclusion that she didn't want more needles and more chemo, and she was done with that. Um, and Grace said it was amazing how clear a child could be about this, how, just how clear a child could be. And so they set about to make the best life they could for the short time that she would feel strong enough. Now, April didn't actually want to go on a trip or go to Disneyland or any of those things. She decided to host an Oscars party for her friends. And she gave out awards to all of her friends for the funniest friend and the most athletic friend and the kindest friend and everything she could think of to give an award to her friends. Now this story has just been stuck with me for days and because we get so worried about the little things, you know, and there's just so much good around us and in our lives. There's so much good in our lives. But I thought, when was the last time we gave our friends an Oscar? When was the last time we remembered to just pick up the phone and, and say how much we appreciate the friends that we have in our life? When's the last time you gave yourself one? When's the last time you walked out into the living room like it was a red carpet and said, I did whatever. I am amazing. Really? Could you do that? Can you do that? Or how about right now? I am amazing. I don't think everybody did it, but okay. <laughs> and it's always about seeing with new eyes. That's what I, you know, I talk a lot about hearing with new ears, but it's also seeing with new eyes. You know, if our eyes are transfixed and focused on some old story, and some old way of being, then we can't really create a new one. If our eyes are transfixed on the things that we 
maybe didn't complete or didn't do right or didn't do gloriously in our past, then we cannot create the new and glorious in front of us. Now, Grace, the mom, she could have very much spent the rest of her life looking back at this story, my daughter died, and no one would have faulted her for that at all. No one. But instead, she looked at her daughter's life and the way she lived it, and she said, how do I serve that? And so she created a foundation that helps critically ill children live out their dreams. And it, this one, it's like Make-A-Wish here, only I think, I think she was in Australia. Because love is an action word, and life is a participation sport, and it does not happen to us, it happens with us. Ernest Holmes wrote, if a man takes his image of thought only from his previous experiences, then he continues in the bondage which those previous experiences create. Jesus understood these great laws of cause and effect in the universe, which work sometimes with great slowness, but always with sureness. Eventually, we shall all understand that all human bondage is an invention of ignorance. I thought continuing to think the same way over and over is our own form of bondage, telling ourselves that we failed at love once before or three times before, so we shouldn't do that anymore. You know, continuing to listen to the same story of how limited our time is or how limited our resources are, or how limited our finances are, all that does is tell the universe that we want to continue to have those same experiences. It just reinforces the old message, and somehow, at some point, we get to turn away from that message and become engaged in a new one. We are called to engage, to look up and out and see the world with new eyes and a new idea and an Oscar for bravery in the middle of it, because this is brave work, this spiritual stuff. It is. But we can allow ourselves to imagine playing bigger and, and larger in our source spirit, the universe. God is unlimited. It is. And so when we're playing life full on, you know, it jumps on our team and plays offense better than we can imagine. You know, I picked the talk title, I don't know, a month ago for today. It was Make It So. Now, if you haven't watched Star Trek Next Generation... It's required, <clears throat> and it's on Netflix. But in that show, Cap, the captain of the ship, Captain Picard, okay, and, and I have to tell you, even I have a crush on Pap Captain Picard, so <laughs> really, it's worth your time. But th <laughs> Hi, honey. So, <laughs> on the ship, there will always be some sort of crisis, right? Like, and you don't want to be the person in the red shirt. But... There's always going to be some kind of crisis. The gravitational field of the entire universe has shifted and the shift is caught in some temporal looping, time warping thing. And they're all going like this, right? But he, Captain Picard, he always he calls together his team and they all are really good at physics. But he calls together his team and he asks how to fix it and their first response is always, oh, you know, we're doomed. And then he's like, that's not acceptable. And then they start to just generate ideas. They, they just, you know, start talking about reversing transducers and doubling back the coupling on the inertial dampeners and firing a torpedo to create a feedback flux or something. <laughs> but they play in possibility. Every show, they play in possibility. What could happen if we tried something completely different than anyone has ever done before? They move beyond the known, and they play in these possibilities, and once they get there, of course, you know, they get to some new possible, they, they talk about it, they talk about it, they talk about it, they figure out the path, and Picard always looks at me and says, make it so. Make it so. And he lets them do, and they do it, of course, every time, because that would be a disappointing end if they didn't, but. <laughs> so Gene Houston teaches a... Uh, course called Unlocking Your Quantum Powers, and in that she says, let us 
again experience this light in an expanded way to living in the light, to begin living outside your former cave of belief, no longer easily fooled by illusions, by shadow plays. You will not only see the true nature of reality, but you will begin to live with the knowledge that the universe is always at the ready to co-create with you. The universe wants to play offense. It must be Bronco season starting. <laughs> I don't, sorry, all the, all the sports metaphors today. So the question becomes for us, am I looking backward for proof of my limitations or am I playing in possibility? Am I playing with the, with the universe? Am I playing with the law? Am I playing with, with all that is possible? And all I want to say to you is engage, dear ones, engage, you know, engage with this spiritual center and this community. We will always see you for the truth of who you are. Always. Engage with the spirit that wants nothing but your expansion and your willingness to shine and play. And play with every ounce of the gift that's within you. Engage with the idea that you are an unlimited being supported by an absolutely unlimited God. I mean, what if you stood up and said that every morning? I am an unlimited being supported by an unlimited God. You could say that too. Really? We're going to do this participatory sport today, right? I am an unlimited being supported by an unlimited God. And that God wants to give you, every one of you, you and you and you and you and you and you, an Oscar. Thank you. Absolutely. You like me really, really like I really like you. I'll give you an Oscar for being the brightest, the kindest, the most amazing you that has ever existed on this planet. The most amazing you is what is called for. Every day, engage, be alive in the light, and make it so. Yeah? So it is. Who wants prayer? Well, thank you. There's no clapping. There's no clapping. <sighs> then I have to go hide somewhere. Sorry, I took a Sudafed this morning and my mouth is like...